evening, everyone. My name is Jeff Lasky. I'm a Kevin Harrington student ambassador here at the uh, New Hampshire Institute of Politics. And on behalf of the New Hampshire Institute of Politics, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event. The Institute's mission is to engage, educate, and empower citizens to actively participate in the civic and political life and strengthen democracy. The Institute is a nonpartisan institution and does not endorse political issues or candidates. Before we begin tonight's event, just a couple housekeeping issues to get out of the way. Please turn off all cell phones, pagers, or beepers, or any, any other devices that would make noise during the, uh, during the time of the event. Also, following Kada Dr. Kadar's remarks, as you saw in your chair, you have a little piece of paper where you can write questions. This gentleman, Brian, in the gray shirt, will be circulating, collecting those questions, which will be posed to Dr. Kadar at the end of the event. Dr. Kadar attended bar Ilan University in Israel, where he received a doctorate in Arabic, as well as a bachelor's degree in political science. He, is currently wor he currently works at bar Ilan University, where he is a professor at the Department of Arabic and Middle Eastern Studies. Prior to his career at bar Ilan University, he served in the Israeli Defense Force for 25 years, where he attained the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and went on to command the group, uh, the Unit 8200, a signals intelligence unit. Dr. Gadar has written numerous books and scholarly articles during which he examines issues such as gender issues in Islamic culture, radical Islamist terrorists, and a myriad of other Middle Eastern-centric issues, which will be the subject of tonight's lecture, Understanding the Middle East. And so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mordecai Gadar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe, for inviting me. And I thank very much all those who took part in arranging this evening, especially the New Hampshire for Israel organization, Karen Weinstein, and uh, my host, Brian, and all the friends which came, the Browns and the others. Thank you very much. And. Uh, with this, with these remarks, I'll begin. Understanding the Middle East, this subject I think will need two semesters and two separate uh, seminars. And I'm not trying to, to be funny. This is uh, what need what needs in order to really understand the Middle East, especially in this country, which is totally different from the culture of the Middle East. And culture, I don't mean literature, I don't mean only uh, literature or, or uh, poetry. Culture is everything. In my view, culture is how people behave, people is religion, people is, uh, culture is uh, uh, habits, um, norms, uh, mores, all these things are the culture of a society. When you come to the Middle East, it's something totally different from what to you or me as a, an Israeli know and believe. Just to give you a little uh, uh, um, glance of the difference, this country is populated by people who are immigrants or descendants of immigrants who came from all over the world to this blessed country. But the, the, the it's not only the fact that they came to America, they came to be Americans. And this is a very big difference because if you take all your family to some place and you remain what you were before, you actually just changed your location. You didn't change your mindset, you didn't change your uh, uh, ways of how you manage yourself. People came here in order to become something different from what they left 
in the homelands. And homelands could be in Asia, and in Europe, and in Africa, and in South America, wherever, wherever people came from to this fortunate country. Ellis Island was actually the beginning of a melting pot where everybody left, everybody adopted new uh, uh, culture of the American dream of life, of liberty, and together to pursue happiness. Yes, I know that there are some enclaves and that uh, 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 New England is not uh, New Orleans, okay, but uh, even if we take this as given, yet the American dream is the very strong common denominator for people in this, uh, in this country. In the Middle East, they didn't witness any immigration. They didn't immigrate. They remained, means the people in the Middle East, over the Middle East, they remained in this place for ages, centuries, millennia. And when you live in a place uh, for a long time, you develop all kinds of structures, social structures, which yet have not developed in this country. If you look at the map, partial map of the Middle East, starting in Libya here, through Egypt, all the way to, uh, to Pakistan, and some countries in the, east, in the east. But this is the core of the Middle East, including Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and so forth. This map shows you every country in one color, creating an impression that every country is one nation or one people, one group, uh, which functions as the citizens of, of this, uh, of this uh, state. This is, in a good case, false presentation. Why? This is, for example, Afghanistan, viewed here as one color of a state. But if you, real, if you really look at the real colors of, uh, of Afghanistan, you see this map. And this is the map of Afghanistan, the real map. Uh, forgive me for having this in Hebrew, but uh, I will read it for you. The different colors are different ethnic groups who live in Afghanistan. Kyrgyzis, Turkmenis, Nuristanis, Pamiris, Pashtunis, Tajikis, Hazaris, Uzbekis, Aymakis, Baluchis, and this is not the end of the list. Different languages. Some of the languages are connected to Persian. Some of the languages are derivatives of Turkic. And uh, some of them are not connected neither to this nor to that. So they have, they have no common language. They live separately in most cases. They don't mingle with each other. And the British and the Russians, when they drew the borders around Afghanistan some 160 years ago, they hope that one day will come and all these groups will sit around one fire and sing Kumbaya together. It never happened, it does not happen, and according to my humble estimation, it will not happen, at least not in the foreseeable uh, uh, future. This is why you need always some warlord to take over the place and to govern it, not in a democratic ways, but in a ways which warlords know uh, to employ um, by buying people, intimidating others, and g getting rid, really rid, of those who wouldn't be bought and wouldn't be intimidated. So this is how countries like Afghanistan is being run. And uh, the Pashtuns, of course, they are the most uh, a powerful minority of, uh, of Afghanistan, usually takes over the whole country. This is why the state, as a framework which was drawn by the Brits, is illegitimate in the eyes of most of its citizenship. And the government is also illegitimate because, because it represents the Pashtuns, usually, and not the Hazaris, and not the Hazaris. And the Hazaris are Shiites. And they are like 
people who nobody wants to touch because they are defiled. So this is the only the structure or the social, in a nutshell, of Afghanistan. Is this country can ever live uh, as an independent or so consolidated state? How do you say, guys? Forget about it? Yes, yes. Another uh, uh, um, success of the British is this one. This is Iraq, the real map of Iraq. This is the map of the tribes, not the uh, ethnic groups, but the tribes, the subdivision of ethnic groups. The north are Kurdish, also fragmented or divided to tribes. From this line and south, these are the Arabs, not only these are Turkmen's and there are some Persians as well. Four ethnic groups, 70 something tribes. In Iraq, they have some eight religions. Religions only in Iraq, are Muslims and Christians, and there are some Jews, and Yazidis, and Sabais, and Mandais, and the uh, Zoroastrians, and some others. Some of them are viewed by Muslims as infidels who should be either converted to Islam or lose their heads. And some of them, like the Muslims and the Christians, are divided to sects. Uh, Sunnis and Shi'is, as we already know, in, in the Islamic uh, uh, group, and some sixth Christian denominations as well. So Iraq was, I don't know, blessed or cursed by having all the four axes of division in the Middle East. The ethnic, between Arabs and Kurds, for example. The tribal, as you see on the map, the religious ones, Jews, Christians, Muslims, and so forth, and the sectarian one, Shiites, Sunnis, and so forth. So again, as a state, it doesn't function. This is, what, this is why for decades it needed a dictator. Otherwise, it cannot function. And definitely you can see these days how the state doesn't function. The democratic elected uh, a government some ministries are not uh, men, no, no minister goes there because they cannot uh, 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 agree on who, which tribe will take the, 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 this ministry or that ministry. And so the, the, the state is uh, malfunctioning uh, for years. However, uh, th this map of tribes is actually something which people in this country are totally unaware of. Tribalism, which is a cornerstone of the culture of the Middle East, or one of the cornerstones of the Middle East, is something which, just uh, uh, imagine that um, um, Manchester, New Hampshire, is one tribe. Means everybody is a cousin of everybody. The first cousin, second cousin, third cousin, fourth, co fourth cousin, and this tribe lives in uh, Manchester, uh, uh, New Hampshire. They don't let anybody else live in this city because this is their city. Um, they have their own leadership. They have their own rules, which in some cases contradict the state rules. Uh, they have their own interest, I mean, economic interest. They have their borders. And they, uh, they, the daughters are marrying only people from Manchester, uh, New Hampshire, because they wouldn't uh, marry anybody else, because others will spy on us if they marry our daughters. They open businesses only within the city because they don't trust anybody else from another tribe. And um, uh, they have a very, very powerful militia armed to its teeth, and you don't want to mess with them. Because first they will kill you, then they will uh, start asking you, you who you were and uh, what you wanted. This is, in a nutshell, tribalism. Um, 
And if, uh, I, I'll just give you uh, two good examples of what it means, the contradiction between the tribe law and the state law. According to any modern state in the world, um, let's say 22 years old um, young lady has the permission to do whatever she likes with whoever she likes, whenever she likes, because she's grown up and she is independent to do with her body whatever she likes. Um, this is according to the state law. However, according to the tribal law in the Middle East, if a 22 years old lady, uh, especially unmarried, allows herself too much with her boyfriend, she brings shame on the family and on the tribe. And what will be done with her? She will be slaughtered because her sin should be cleaned with her blood. Okay? So according to the state, she's okay because she's a grown-up. According to the tribe, she should be decapitated. So definitely you, can, you cannot reconcile between these two systems. And another good example, if uh, one of the, uh, 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 your cousins in the city killed somebody else from another city, from Derry, for example, from the tribe of Derry, um, um, you, as his cousin, second or third or fourth cousin, you should hide him or arrange something that he vanishes so the police can, uh, can catch him. This is according to the tribal law because he's your cousin. You will never give him in. According to the state law, you are a partner in crime if you hide him. According to the tribal law, you are a hero if you hide your cousin. So what law should you, should you follow? The tribal law or the state law? So the state is viewed in tribal society, like in Iraq, the state is the enemy of the tribes because the state tries all the time to impose itself, impose its laws, and impose the loyalty on the people, so the people will be loyal to the state rather than being loyal to the tribe. This is why the state is illegitimate, as viewed by the most of the tribes, because the only one tribe which controls the state, and in this, in the Iraqi uh, um, uh, case, it was the Dulaimis, the, the tribe of uh, uh, Saddam Hussein, for example, which is a small but very vicious uh, um, uh, tribe, the state serves only the, the tribe because since he doesn't trust anybody, he will nominate his brothers as his ministers, his cousins as the heads of departments, his second cousins as commanders of the, of the uh, 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 divisions in the army, uh, third cousins or fourth cousins will be the commanders of the air force and so forth, and the family, Cosa Nostra, actually runs the country. Who wants them? So it is legitimate, the state only in the eyes of the ruling tribe or the spokespeople of the, peop of the, of the state. So this is why other states, like in the West, they don't understand it because whoever comes to the media actually serves the ruling elite or the ruling family while they shut others' mouths so they don't, don't go to the media to, uh, 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 to say how much they are oppressed under this kind of regime. So. Uh, this is what tribal states are. The state is illegitimate in the eyes of the vast, vast majority of the people, and the regime is illegitimate because it represents only one small minority. The same thing was with uh, um, uh, uh, Libya and Gaddafi. Gaddafi also, in Libya is even more fragmented. Th this, in, in Iraq, they have like 70 something uh, uh, tribes uh, who are peasants because there are two rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris, and between the, the, tri the, be between the rivers they have some canals so they can have some kind of, of uh, uh, agriculture in this place. Although Iraq is total uh, desert, no rain, so uh, in, in such a desert, if you are not a fighting militia, you are dead because others will be willing to chase you out from your source of living and take the place because they also want to drink. And it's not like in this country where you take a, a journey of 10 miles and you cross in the middle at least five rivers. 
This is not the situation in the Middle East. Necessity to live in an environment where these resources are so poor definitely makes you into a fighter because in the Middle East, if you don't fight for your life, you are a dead tribe or a dead man. Uh, once uh, uh, one of the Turkish uh, leaders, Suleiman Demirel, once said that in the Middle East, everybody takes part in a very big feast. Either you are on the chair or you are on the plate. And you decide. Because if you, are, if you are not on the chair, you are on the plate. So uh, this is uh, in, in a Turkish way how to uh, describe uh, the Middle East. Um, so if you hear, for example, today that uh, uh, Bashar Assad has already butchered some 65,000 of his, 65,000 of his citizens during the last two years only because he wants to remain stuck to his, to his chair. This is this. Either you are on a chair or you are on the plate. And he doesn't want to be on the plate, so he is with a very long knife on the chair. So this is what explains the mindset. And I'll stop here about tribalism because I want to go to other uh, uh, characteristics, but there is much what to be said, said in the seminary about tribalism, which we will take in the first semester. Okay, this was the introductory for the first semester, which will take who knows how many lectures about only tribalism. What is tribalism in the Middle East? And uh, uh, the rest is what we will learn during the semester. Now we go to the second semester, to the other uh, 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 problem of the Middle East, which is the question of religion. Of course, in this country, in God we trust, as uh, we all know, but uh, religion in this country uh, should not be um, any, or should not have any influence on politics. This is one of the givens, I believe, in the United States of America. But when it comes to the Middle East, the situation is a bit different. This, for example, is the map of Syria, uh, divided to districts or uh, administrative dis districts. However, these districts reflect also the structure of the society. This uh, blue part is Kurds, a different ethnic group. Most of them are um, Sunni Muslims. Uh, but since they are Kurds and not Arabs, they have different districts that live usually separate, and they have their own district in Syria. There are some neighborhoods of Kurds which emigrated to cities, but usually this is the Kurdish uh, uh, district. Uh, these two districts are the Alawis. And the Alawis uh, live in the mountains, because there, there is a chain of mountains which starts in Turkey, goes down to, through Syria, Lebanon, into Israel or the Palestine. Um, this chain of mountains is populated mainly by minorities, religious minorities. I mean, Shiites, Christians, Alawis, and um, Druze, especially in Lebanon. Minorities, usually not Sunni Muslims. Why? Because those mountains provided security to all those persecuted minorities, which were persecuted by the Sunni Muslims, mainly by the Ottomans, who ruled this, this region for 400 years between 1517 and 1917. So being persecuted, all these minorities ran to the mountains to live in the mountains, because the man, in the mountains you can block the roads very easily. You can roll rocks on somebody who comes to attack you, you can block roads, you can, uh, and, and anybody who wants to invade the region has to stick to paths, and it's very hard to navigate, or to, to find your way when they, those who defend themselves are above you and throw uh, arrows at you or whatever. And, and so this is 
This is why they all live in the, uh, uh, in the mountains. The Alawis uh, live in the mountains because they are sheer infidels. Their, um, their, uh, 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 their religion involves uh, idols. You know what? I'll show you some of them. This is the jacket of uh, my book about okay, Assad in search of legitimacy, which I published a few years ago. And in the uh, back uh, uh, cover, I pasted a um, picture, a photo which I took of a sanctuary of an Alawi uh, from our, our village. You can very clearly see here two doves. Um, down here they also have doves on this pole and in this uh, vitrine here which you see in the background there is a, a statue of Saint Mary inside. Uh, for a Muslim to see in a sanctuary doves and a human being means a statue of a human being he gets the goosebumps because this is definitely idol worshipping. Having doves like this and, and, and uh, St. Mary definitely, uh, totally uh, unacceptable by Muslims. Um, and if you want to read about the religion of the Alawis there is a good description in the Encyclopedia of Islam under the entry Nusayuriya. A very uh, uh, strange religion which is combination of uh, uh, Eastern Christianity, uh, Shi'i Islam, and um, local religions from the Middle East which were in the Middle East some 6,000 years ago. Uh, where you can find all kinds of remains in Ebla and Ugarit and all these ancient cities which, are, uh, uh, dis which were discovered during the 20th century. Uh, definitely a religion of uh, inf total infidels according to Islam and they are the rulers of Syria. Since uh, the, the, the French which uh, created Syria uh, during the 40s and nominated or gave power to the to the Alawis, and now they are, or at, um, at least until now, they are the rulers of Syria. Now this sect, not only they have no legitimacy to rule the country because they are a minority of some 10% of the population, there is a very big question if according to Islam, they at all have the right to live being infidels. Because according to Islam, the infidel has the choice between converting to Islam or being shortened by head. And the Alawis who are in power in Syria, the Assad, father, the Assad son, means Hafez and Bashar, both are Alawis, they know very well that if they fail to remain in power, they will not be kicked out. They will not only be kicked out from power, they most probably will be slaughtered. And their brothers, the Alois, will be also slaughtered. So, and this is unfortunately the Middle East. Whether because a revenge of the 65 people who were killed only in this round of violence, which started two years ago almost in March 2010, but all the Syrians remember the former round, which was between 1976 and 1982, where F Father Assad slaughtered around 50,000 as well, along of six years, mainly in Hamad of uh, February uh, 1982, where some 20 were uh, uh, slaughtered in three weeks of uh, uh, clashes. So definitely uh, the Muslims in Syria carry very heavy burden of hatred 
against those Alawis, and uh, the first minute which they can do it, they will do what is needed to do in this uh, a, a, as revenge against what happens there. Now, what happens in Syria, I don't know if you guys know, it's not only that the regime kills people. They kill the men, usually, and rape the women. And there are enough clips on YouTube which we can look and see what happens to girls in this, uh, in this place, unfortunately, because this is also part of the culture of the Middle East. When a tribe def is defeated, the men are uh, uh, killed and the women are raped. Look at what happened in Darfur of mass rapes. In Iraq, it happened too much. It happened in Sudan in the vicious war, which was there for 50 years. Who heard about this war between the northern uh, part of Sudan, the Islamic uh, uh, part, and the southern part of the Christians and the, uh, and the animists of southern Sudan? War which lasted for at least 50 years. Two million people were killed, and who knows how many women were raped. This, unfortunately, is the Middle East. So the role of religion, uh, religion plays definitely major role in politics, especially when it comes to struggles between the tribes, between ethnic groups, uh, between at, le uh, at least uh, uh, religious uh, groups. Uh, Sudan was divided according to religious lines. A year and a half ago, the North is Islamic, or northern, the state of Northern Sudan is an Islamic state. The state of Southern Sudan is Christian and animists. Okay, so definitely religion played a role in the division of Sudan. Um, other places as well, as you know, in Egypt, uh, which has an Islamic ma a majority, the Christians, the Copts, are uh, running away from this country in increasing numbers. And not because of the weather, okay? Because of persecution of Muslims, especially since Mubarak had to, uh, was kicked out by the military. And now the Muslim Brotherhood controlled the country with the Salafis, um, persecute the, the, the Christians, and they are running away uh, in big numbers. Definitely because they are Christians. And those Copts are actually the indigenous people of Egypt because uh, Egypt was Christian before it, before it was occupied by the Muslims who invaded Egypt in the seventh century. And Islam was imposed on those Christians since the seventh century. So definitely those Copts, by the way, the, the name Copt is, a, is um, actually Egypt, which Egypt, the real uh, Egyptians are the Copts. And they are the indigenous people of the country. And now they have to leave the country because of the Muslims who invaded into this country and um, impose or try to impose Islam until this very day on those unfortunate people, uh, the original inhabitants of uh, Egypt. So definitely when you go from a, a country to country, you see how religion actually plays a major role in disputes and struggles inside those countries. I will spare you the scenery, but there is a clip which at least was in the internet for a while, uh, where in Tunisia, uh, some Muslims slaughter a man who dared to convert to Christianity. And it sh the clip shows how they slaughter him, how they cut his, how they behead him, and the whole thing is, you can see it, dreadful uh, uh, clip, but this is what happens, unfortunately, in a place like Tunisia, which was a secular country, secular country under the, the leadership or the rulership of um, Zain al-Abdi bin Ali, who was forced to run away uh, uh, two years ago because of the Arab Spring. And so religion is this, this is the second uh, semester, or the role of religion in understanding the Middle East. The third component, and this will be the summer semester, is the role of history in the Middle East. I assume that um, 
the civil war in this country doesn't have a direct influence on daily politics of the United States of America. Correct me if I'm wrong. It was a war. People were killed. People fought each other. Definitely, but I don't, I don't believe that today politics are influenced by the civil war, or by the memories of the civil war of this country. Uh, in the Middle East, the situation is totally different. History in some things play a major role even in daily politics. And I give you only one example because this is understood. When the Prophet Muhammad uh, died in the year of 632, he forgot to nominate the one who will replace him. This fact actually uh, created the dispute on the caliphate between what is called today the Sunnah and the Shia. They had some caliphs, and the fourth caliph was Ali. His name was Ali. He was the cousin of the prophet and his son-in-law, because he married his only daughter, Fatma. Uh, another man took the caliphate from him. His name was Muawiyah. And until this very day, the, those Shiites, those who are called Shiites, are those who think that Ali should have been the caliph and his descendants until the end of time should have been the caliphs always. The Sunnis believe that uh, Muawiyah, the one who took the caliphate and became the fifth caliph, he was the right or the legitimate caliph and his descendants until the end of time should have been the caliphs of the Islamic world. So actually this is a dispute about politics. Who shall be or who should be the caliph, whether Ali and his sons and grandsons and so forth, or Muawiyah and his descendants. This is actually what the basis of the dispute between uh, uh, the Sunnis and the Shi'is. Now this dispute started immediately when Muhammad, Muhammad uh, shut his eyes forever in the year of 632 CE. Means in 20 years it will be 15 centuries? 15 centuries in 20 years from today. So they are still killing each other in masses because of this dispute who was the real caliph almost 15 centuries ago. Just to compare, you remember what happened here in this country in the elections of 2000 in Florida because of some ballots which were not clear whether it went to George W. Bush or to Al Gore. So they went to uh, the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decided that these ballots go to George W. Bush and America had a, pre had a president for four years and another four years. Nobody in this country, after the verdict of the Supreme Court, nobody dared to challenge the legitimacy of the presidency of George W. Bush, only because of this issue in Florida. Because once the court decided, he finished all the disputes, and now America has a president, and that's it. Imagine that the American nation is divided, half support George W. Bush, half support Al Gore, and these two halves are fighting each other with tanks, with cannons, with airplanes, with atom bombs, with whatever they have for 15 centuries. Okay? This is exactly, exactly the Sunni, Shi'i, rift or fight, or name it as you want. We remember the war between Iran and Iraq between 1980 and 1988. This was, the, the Shi'i Sunni issue was behind this whole thing between Iraq because Iraq 
was governed by Sunnis, the Saddam Hussein, and, uh, and Iran was the Shis. Uh, what you see today inside Iraq between the Sunnis and the Shis, which blow each other uh, every other day, the mosques, they, they blow the mosques with people inside. Uh, look at Hezbollah today, fight, which are Shis, fighting the Syrians uh, uh, in who are mostly Sunnis inside Syria. And Syria today actually is a battlefield of a Shi coalition of Iran, Iraq, and Hezbollah, which supports the regime against a Sunni coalition of Turkey, Jordan, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, who support the majority of Syria who are Sunni Muslims. So definitely, this 65,000 casualties of Syria of the last uh, uh, two years are actually casualties of a dispute which started 15 centuries ago between the Sunnis and the Shis. So definitely, history is not only alive and kicking, history is also alive and killing in the Middle East. And um, blood revenge between tribes can last for centuries because if they kill us, some, some of us will kill one of them after two years, 10 years, 20 years. Only recently some killer came out from jail in Israel after he spent 28 years in jail because he murdered somebody. The day that he came out from jail, he was murdered by the relatives of the one whom he murdered. There is a Bedouin saying which says that a Bedouin took revenge after 40 years and he said, well, I did it very fast after 40 years. Okay, so they have time. Actually, the, uh, uh, the Quran says in one of the verses, in Allah ma'asabirin, Allah is with those who have patience. So uh, definitely, in this, issue, in this issue of the presence of history in daily life and in daily death is something which definitely characterized the Middle East, especially opposed to this fortunate country. The fourth component of Middle Eastern culture, which I would like to mention, is something else, but, but for, for this, we already in the second year after we finished uh, the summer uh, and the semester. And this is something which, again, hard to believe and hard to understand. When people uh, live in a miserable uh, situation, either they go to the street to demonstrate or they try to do something, you know, to make their situation better, they do something with the situation. But when we come to the Middle East, we see something which people find it hard to understand and sometimes even to believe. Uh, when you go to a place like Egypt, for example, uh, you, you, you can find very easily that some 40% of the Egyptians live in unplanned neighborhoods. Unplanned neighborhoods means living in a place like this, in a house like this, without running water, without sewage, without electricity, without phone, without nothing. And such a house, which is like three yards length and two yards width, can house a man, three of his wives, and uh, well, no, 15 kids, and all live in this hut or box, or name it the way we like. 35 or so more or less percent of the Egyptian population lives in such conditions. 
Today in Egypt, there are some 90 million people. So some 30 million live in such conditions. I can show you some other. This is another neighborhood like this. You know what this is? This part and this part. This is the oven. See this cover? This is where they put the fire from inside. And uh, it's outside. Why outside? So people don't get choked at home. This is another unplanned neighborhood in uh, Port Said. Uh, the British maybe built this floor and uh, the people built another floor, another floor, and they built the floors from whatever they find in the streets and these things collapse and bury people under them during the nights. And in, in this neighborhood, since it's unplanned, in the on the maps you'll not find anything because the municipality never uh, recognized this map, this uh, neighborhood. So the municipality doesn't give water, no sewage, no electricity, no nothing. How can people live in such a thing? But they do because they don't have any other uh, alternative. Now the question is, why don't they? Demonstrate against this. Okay, we saw last last two years they did and they changed Mubarak. What do you think? How many families came out from these neighborhoods because of the change of the regime? Zero. Not only this. Today, more people are in these neighborhoods because of the economic collapse of Egypt because of the Arab Spring. No, no uh, uh, tourism, no investments. So. No money. People who earned some money because of they were uh, uh, dealing with tourists and all kinds of souvenirs and transportation, whatever uh, tourists uh, did in Egypt, today they are unemployed. So what can they do? Only to go to these neighborhoods because they cannot have, they cannot pay the rent in any other place. So these neighborhoods during the last two years are even bigger than what they were before the Arab Spring and uh, no investments. Who will invest in a country which nobody knows what will be there tomorrow? So definitely these uh, 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 unfortunate neighborhoods where people live. Now the question is, how come? Why don't, the, why don't they demonstrate every day against this situation? How can you explain that the people live there without sewage? Would anybody of us agree to, to live in a house without sewage? The name of the problem is fatalism. Fatalism is the feeling of the person and the group that whatever happens to them has to happen. It is a word of God or act of God or decision of God that they should live in this neighborhood as miserable as it is. They are not allowed, they are not able to do anything about this because this is their fate. And they surrender to the fate and they live with this and they die with this. Because this is, as they say in Arabic, mahkum alena or maktub alena. Mahkum alena means this is our verdict and uh, or the verdict which is about us and maktub alena means it is written on us, means everybody on his forehead written his fate. And when fatalism is the name of the game, people are like sheep. They don't rebel, they don't demonstrate, they don't do anything against the fate. They live with this and they, with that and they die with this. And this was ex what explains the duration of this situation. I don't believe that any of us would agree to live without electricity, without sewage, without running water, even half a day, even half a day. They live uh, not only one generation, two and three and four generations. And in these neighborhoods, because of the density, girls are being wedded 
at the age of 12. Women of 25 are grandmothers because they were married off at the age of 12 and so are their daughters. In the age of 37, you are a great grandmother. And this is what happens in these neighborhoods. Imagine the demography. How big is the uh, popula uh, population growth in these neighborhoods? What is the crime in these neighborhoods? Drugs, alcohol, all the plagues which could be are in these neighborhoods. Again, fatalism is what enables this to be more than half a day because they believe that this is what, the, what happens to them should happen to them. And their ability to resist against the situation in most cases does not exist. This is some kind of a culture which also you can find in India in some places, in South America in some little places, but definitely defines or characterizes large uh, neighborhoods of the Middle East. Where is the hope? Where is the future? Is there any way how to change the situation of tribalism, of uh, government of religion, of fatalism, and the rule of history? Is there a way how to change culture of a region? We have to be optimistic. Europe of 500 years ago was pretty much like the Middle East of today. Wars of 100 years, wars of 30 years, wars of six years as we saw only 70 something years ago. Definitely miserable continent it was. Human rights during the 16th, 17th, 18th century were more or less like in the Middle East. You know, New South Wales in Australia, the populations there was pe were people who were caught in the London market after they stole a piece of bread. They were deported to New South Wales. Okay, so human rights in Europe of the 18th century, maybe 19th century as well, were more or less what you can witness in the Middle East today. So if Europe changed through the years, we do have the hope that within significant time, we can see in the Middle East also some changes. However, as we say in Israel, Changes with big groups is like to take a U-turn with a train. It is not easy. You can take a U-turn with a little car because it's a little thing. Means indiv individualistic society can introduce changes. But when you talk about groups like tribes, in Iraq, uh, in Iraq tribes are hundreds of thousands of people who share all this, the same a set of values. So it's rather hard to change the direction of such a big uh, 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 group of, of, of people. However, it can happen, especially through the modern media, internet, which in the Middle East today is like 10% of exposure to the, to, the, to the internet. In this country, I think it's around 80% of the people have some access to internet, and with the cell phones, it even increases. In the Middle East, it's around 10%. And there is, so there is there are pros prospects for growth. Uh, the satellite TV also reaches large numbers, large numbers of, uh, pop of people, and they also introduce changes, not as fast as was anticipated in the beginning, but definitely people are exposed to new ideas uh, which are disseminated by the mass media. And um, if uh, the rate of, uh, of uh, uh, literacy will, will be higher with the years, definitely people will be more uh, able to absorb new ideas. Yet, again, as we say in Israel, changes 
in the Middle East uh, happen just like uh, porcupines make kids, very slowly and very carefully. Because if you invade a country and you try to change it within one day or one month or even one year, as happened in Iraq, what you get is you break, you pay. And this is actually what happened in Iraq because when originally in 2003, before the invasion of Iraq, the plan was that in three months, by June, the mission will be accomplished. And it didn't happen. It is very hard to change culture of uh, states. And before uh, states like the United States interfere in other countries, th those who take decisions in this, in this country should learn the culture of the countries which they try to change because it is very hard to change culture of big groups. You can change culture of one person, especially if you send his kids to a public school which acts like a melting pot. But you cannot do it with, the, with groups of hundreds of thousands of even or millions of people. It doesn't work. So definitely there are prospects of change, yet it will take time. Unfortunately, it might take some skulls as well, as we see in Syria. Uh, but as I'm always, I'm com compulsive optimistic because I can see the future from what I see today. And there are changes, yet not fast enough, but definitely in 200 years, 300 years, uh, uh, changes will be accomplished even in the Middle East, just, just as they happened in uh, Europe. Be optimistic. Let's live and see what will happen in 300 years in the Middle East. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Means peace upon you, uh, the mercy of Allah and his blessings. Thank you very much.